everybody. I'm Pete Nigerian, and this is Doug Gazarian, who I absolutely love you, Doug. And we're, we're brothers from another because we're two Armenian guys uh, that um, have been going through life in a lot of ways. We, it's funny how our paths are so similar because anybody who doesn't know enough about the background of Doug, he started out in California, went all the way out to Brown University, so he traveled across the entire United States to go to college unbelievable water polo player, right? I mean, uh, I, 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 I didn't know that until we, I was checking out a few things and I'm like, right. wow, this guy, because I know who water polo, that is a brutal sport. It's like rugby in the water, right? I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, it's one of those crazy sports and, and like kind of lacrosse in the Northeast in, in Southern California and really all of California. It's sort of that regional cult kind of, at least what I grew up. Now it's a little bit more uh, across the nation, but still regional. But, uh, yeah, I would say great, but I, I was lucky enough to play in college at Brown and had, a, you know, just a great experience. But it was, it was a lot of hell, to be honest, growing through uh, high school and those swim workouts in the morning before, oh. before school. And, but, you know, you yourself played sports, obviously, at a, at a high level, too. And anyone who's played sports knows the, the kind of commitment it takes. So, but looking back, it was, it was many years ago and many pounds ago, Pete. <laughs> well, you're downplaying it, but you got four-year letterman. You're a co-captain of a nationally ranked team at Brown. I mean, uh, so I don't want you to play it down too much, but I Thank mean, you, you know, you, you're, you're right below Matt Biondi in my mind. Right, right. You know, <laughs> you're, you're the old Cal guy, so. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it was a great experience, and, you know, like I said, it's one of those things that you can't really identify with unless you do it, and I'm yeah. very lucky to have done it, especially at the college level. Well, and the cool thing, too, is then you decided to get your, your BA in economics, which I find interesting. Now, here's, here's where we separate, though, because, we, you know, we got these paths. I started out in the Bay Area, California, moved to Minnesota, was going to go back and play football at Cal, but stayed at the University of Minnesota. But I, I got uh, my, my degree was in the sciences and was planning on going to medical school like my father and follow kind of in his footsteps. Uh, that's where we separate because you did the economic side. Meanwhile, I went into business years later, and here you are. I guess you're in business, but you're really in the sports world, the sports business. Yeah, you know, so we talk about the sports betting odds and, and point spreads is really like a market. So um, the math of it has always been sort of something that's intrigued me. Obviously, I'm a sports junkie, and I'm passionate as a sports fan. But for, without a doubt, we have guys that we call arbitragers. We have basically derivative traders. But you'll hear terms, Pete, of guys – like let's say the Lakers are favored by four and a half. They'll say, yeah, I bought some at three and a half, sold some at four and a half. Like you hear that, especially like I have a good friend who's a pro better and lives in Vegas and he used to work at the Merck in Chicago. And, you know, he just kind of looks at it commodities. And what's funny <laughs> is I was talking to him and I, you know, I lived out there before coming to ESPN in Connecticut and I was talking to him and he was asking about the world baseball classic. I believe it was new. And he was, and again, this was like 10-ish, 12-ish years ago. And he's like, is this Robinson Cano guy any good? I'm like, yeah, he's like a batting champ on the Yankees. Like, how do you not know him? He's like, he's like, I'm a football guy. Like, I'll, I'll trade. And he goes, I'll trade Japanese canoeing if I can make money off of it. So it just shows that it's a numbers game more than it's like kind of a sports game, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I find the whole thing really amazing. And then you, then you decide to go to Vegas and become not only a guy in the media world right out of the gate, but uh, tell us a little bit about Vegas. What you, what brought you to Vegas initially? Was it the job? Was it the opportunity? Yeah, no, it, it was the job. And I, I think the best comparison for a lot of colleagues of mine, I did it, I can only speak to my path, but it's, it's a common path in broadcasting, kind of like the minor league uh, of baseball sort of thing. So you start out in small towns, make no money. Right. You kind of work your way up. So I started in Missouri and Iowa. I did the whole carrying the camera and tripod, editing my own video. And I'd be anchoring in shorts because it was 100 and something degrees in the Midwest and soupy, as you very well know. And so you do all that. You kind of like learn the ropes. And you don't want to say it's the minor leagues because obviously there's – you take every day as serious because there's people who live there. But you know you're not going to be there forever. But I was in Iowa four years and loved it and still have good friends there. And – um you send out tapes back then it was VHS tapes and then slowly became DVDs. And then now it's web links, but you know, you send out tapes and I had a couple of nibbles here and there. I had, you know, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, Columbus, Ohio, wow. and then Vegas, it just worked out well. I didn't have a contract. They needed someone right away. And I was being from LA. I sort of knew their sports towns. They joked at the time. It was like a suburb of LA. So I knew the Lakers cold having grown up in LA and being such a diehard Lakers fan. It just worked out well. So, 
even though I knew about point spreads and odds and I'd been to Vegas a bunch having grown up in LA and gone home with college buddies and all that, it was not something that I thought was like an ultimate destination. It just worked out that the job search and sending out all those tapes, I got the bite of it from a city that it worked out and then I was able to go there and really kind of take a big step in my career and sort of solidify um, my, just hone my skills and really get a foundation of what was to come in the future. Hey, I got to ask you just because you brought it up. So when you brought up uh, Tennessee and Ohio, those were in major football towns that you were looking at. Right. Were you in Iowa? Were you in Iowa City or where were you? Well, I was in the Quad Cities, which is the border of Iowa and Illinois. So there's four cities. Anyone who's seen uh, Tommy Boy when they get lost and David Spades at the gas station asking 22 miles to Davenport to get yourself another map. Well, actually, all maps of the, have both kind of the, the city on the other side. Yeah. Of, the, of the border so you didn't need another map but it was funny for the movie but yeah it was like Davenport Iowa and all that and so it was about 45 minutes from Iowa City it was the season Brad Banks and the Hawkeyes had one loss end up playing USC in the Orange Bowl so I would go out there quite a bit Kirk Ferentz one of his best teams ever so, but it mostly it was the local kind of D3 schools and then just you know we did Cubs highlights and it was yeah. I was there when Bartman did his thing for the Cubbies and uh oh, was that that game Oh, you were? That's awesome. I was living in Chicago at the time. I was working on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I'm not a huge baseball fan, so I got to put that out there. But right. a good friend offers me seats, and they literally right down the first baseline. I mean, I couldn't have been more lucky. I'm right down the first baseline. I'm at this game, and I see Bartman make that move. And everybody around me is a Cubs fan, of course. And I'm, I'm fine being a Cubs fan, whatever. But uh, I, I wasn't really as into it as everybody else. But I'm sitting there. And boy, they were they were using every expletive that you'd ever imagine oh. about it. But the meanwhile, I'm looking at these guys going, you know, I get it. But how many of the guys that are right next to me on the first baseline, if the ball's coming right to them, they're not reaching for it too. Right, they would have done the same thing, you would think. At least, it's safe to say Bartman wasn't the only person at Wrigley Field that day who would have done that. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a reaction, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> that's for what sure. you're doing. You know, if the ball's coming towards you, you're going to do something usually. Um, but boy, they had to, they had the security guards had to walk them out of there. And we all know the story. I mean, that, but that was, that was crazy. That was absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. So I was on the border, and I went to Iowa City a couple times for work, but mostly it was local. And then I, I did get to go to the, um, some game. Like, I went to a, a Bears playoff game against the Eagles, and I got to travel to Cubs opening day. So I did some things that felt big, if you will. Rams uh, training camp is there in Macomb, Illinois. So I did some cool stuff, especially when I'm, you know, my early 20s, trying to figure it all out. Um, you get that taste. And, you know, every day was just cooler, and I wanted to do more. And I just, you know, I was bit by the bug, even back in college with internships. I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. Well, then, then you decided, uh, or, or it was offered to you at least, to, uh, I, did you go straight to ESPN from Las Vegas? Is that Yeah, so I was, you know, the, you, they call the term market hop, like you can jump yeah. markets, and, but I tended to do it a little bit longer than others. So I was in Iowa four years, Vegas seven, and then ESPN. So some people bounce around threes and twos. I just didn't want to do that. And also, I overlapped in Vegas when I, with the economic crisis. So it was sports departments were kind of downsizing. There was, it was a very fluid industry at the time. Internet was becoming more of a staple for local news sites. And then, um, obviously, there's, it became just a bigger part of the, the media and, and, and then the cord cutters and all that. So it's, it was a shifting industry. Yeah. And I weathered the storm, did some news anchoring as well. So staying put in Vegas, I had a great gig. I, had a, I launched a radio show on betting as well with a couple of buddies. And it was just the right fit for me. And I didn't want to, I mean, I was the, you know, the main sports guy at an ABC affiliate. And I got to go to all the fights and it just had really good content that I thought was, you know, I didn't want to give up per se. Was that the Las Vegas sports line? Is that the, was yes. That the yeah, that was the show I, I founded with some buddies. Oh, that's really cool. Well, here's where the other weird tie comes in. Because you you come to ESPN, yeah, and you know it, it was something. It was always a dream of mine. I've done some college football color commentary in the Midwest when I was living in Chicago after I got done playing football, and uh, and I played out in Sacramento in the World Football League. Do you do you even know what that is? You're too young, probably, or whatever. It was ninety one, ninety two, and then they went to Europe or whatever. But, you know, I, I've I've heard of it, and I've kind of been aware of like Euro Ball, NFL Europe, and all that. But yeah, I was not a. It was not appointment TV for me. For, right. I'll tell you what, day. it was the most, it, in all honesty, though, uh, if you forget about pay, because our pay was okay. It wasn't terrible, but uh, it was the most fun football I ever had the opportunity wow. to play. It was better than college. 
It was better than the NFL in terms of fun, enjoying what we were doing. Everybody got paid basically the same and everything was based on incentive pay, which I really liked because for instance, we led the league the first two years in defense. We led in almost every category. And so you'd get X number of dollars for this leading thing. And it was more team based. Gotcha. But there was some individual stuff, but I'll tell you the amazing thing and then we'll jump back to it. But the amazing thing was I had a couple of guys on that team of mine who hit it big, literally, we won the World Bowl in 92. A month later, they're in training camp with the various teams that they signed with, and three of the guys were all pro that year. So wow. think of that. You, you played an entire straight year of football, <laughs> not with no break whatsoever, because we were February to uh, early June. Camp started in July. These guys started playing. And you might remember Mike Jones, a linebacker for St. Louis, who made the – Of course, went to Mizzou. Back. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The big play at the end of the uh, Titans Super Bowl. Yep. He kept, kept the Titans out of the end zone at the very last. That, he was a running back who I am the guy Correct. who turned him into a linebacker because he was with the Raiders and they asked me to help turn him into a linebacker. <laughs> so I did. And then of course I lose my job. But anyway, <laughs> it's what we do. We're nice people. We try to. Right. Help but I know what you mean though, because when I was in Vegas, one of the many things I did was it was overlapped with the United Football League, the UFL. Yeah. And they had a handful of teams, one of which was the Las Vegas Locos. Jim Fossil, yep. former Giants coach, was the head coach. I did the coaches show oh, cool. because it was on our – so we had that affiliation. So I even flew to Arizona and interviewed guys like Denny Green and then some other players. And there's been a ton of the guys who have eventually gone on to the league. A lot of kickers. Right. Uh, Hauschka originated from the UFL, and then he won a Super Bowl. But I know what you mean in terms of the love of the game, if you will – and having that sort of second tier football, but guys right there on the cusp. Yeah. And again, some guys got some, some, some nibbles and it overlapped. It, it, was, it was concurrently. So it was in the fall on like Thursdays and Fridays, sometimes Saturdays. And that Dante Culpepper played in the league too. Yeah. And then sometimes the season ended in like November and then there'd be injuries in the NFL and then they would kind of get promoted, if you will. Did Omaha have a team in the UFL? Yeah, the Nighthawks. They played in Rosenblatt Stadium. That's right. And, and you know who their coach was? You may or may not. Do you know who their coach was? Oh, I the guy from the Browns, maybe? No, it was Joe Moglia. Oh, yes, he was. Yes, the Ameritrade guy. Here's the crazy part. He's the Ameritrade guy, like you said, but he was a coach. He coached in the Ivy League. He was, a, he was an incredible right. high school coach out on the East Coast. Goes to the Ivy League, does really well. He decides he's bored. He gets into finance. Next thing you know, he's He's running a company out on the East Coast, gets hired by TD Ameritrade, goes to Omaha, decides, I want to get back in football. He goes, <laughs> he goes and works with the University of Nebraska. He gets the job with the Nighthawks. Correct. And he didn't take a salary as well at Nebraska, I believe. Right. He worked for free, just basically mirroring the head coach. <laughs> no, it's an awesome story, and especially yeah. now with the advancement of analytics and stuff. I mean, we're, we're seeing guys like that in the booths, yeah. but not hold, like, head coaching positions. So yeah. it was a good – it was a good publicity move, but it also made sense on the field. Yep. And he ended up going actually down in the South and, and had a great career down in, in uh, oh, shoot, somewhere in Carl, the uh, The Chanticleers, right? Yes. Um, yep. Is it not Charleston, but it's uh, – Not Charleston. So I, I know the mascot, but I can't think of the name, right? <laughs> and I talk to Joe all the time. Joe's such a nice guy. He really yeah. is because he's got the finance and football, and he and I always are talking back and forth. And, oh, shoot, I just was texting him yesterday. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of relationships. Just a – a terrific guy and, and does a lot for a lot of people. But so you and I meet at ESPN. Right. And uh, it was that you, do you know how I ended up being at ESPN? <laughs> well, no, I, I know you did some, some, some called some games in the field. Yeah. And then you and I met in the studio for a show called goal line. But yeah, tell me the backstory. You might've told me at the time. I just don't recall. No, you, you know, we had so little time to do it. Cause I, we'll get into that in a second, but I, Long story short, Lou Holtz invited me to be his one of his four speakers about his life for a um, lads thing in New York City. And, and I don't realize it till I get there, but there's 5,000 people there. I think there's going to be 500. Sure. 5,000 people there. And now I got to get up and talk in front of everybody. And oh, by the way, it's all Notre Dame. I, I'm standing there. They're Lou's lads. That was a really fun. I'm standing there. I'm like, I'm from the University of Minnesota. What the hell? What, 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 why am I here? <laughs> but, right. But Lou picked me, and it was great. It was a great opportunity, and the guys from ESPN came up and said, you ought to be doing ESPN. And I said, wow. well, I wanted to, and I actually sent you something once, but you probably put it in the garbage. <laughs> so the good news was they hired me, and uh, 
and it was a lot of fun. And I did a lot of games, you know, both in and out. But the goal line, I did that for a couple of years. You and I met while I was doing that. I it usually was me and Zubin Mahete, who's an awesome anchor. Absolutely. The, the Fantastic guy. Yeah. 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 But you'd come in and fill in sometimes for Zubin. And I'm sitting there looking around going, well, who, who fills in for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so we would stagger the shift, right? So it would start at noon when the games start. Yep. And for the, it's basically red zone for, for college football, right? Yeah. So it would start at noon and go all the way at tonight, like Pac-12 after dark, although that phrase hadn't been coined yet. Right. And so Zub and I would split the shifts. because, But you didn't have anyone <laughs> splitting, so you would be there all day. And you can imagine, you know, it gets pretty involved, right? The NFL has, what, like eight games tops in a certain window, maybe nine. But, you know, we have a lot more in college football. Now, we're not tracking everything the same amount. Obviously, the, the ranked teams get more sort of attention, which you right. never know, last-minute stuff. Some of the one double A or FCS at the time. Um, I, I thought it was uh, an iron, like Iron Man shift out of you every Saturday. <laughs> Well, it was really fun. I actually really enjoyed it. I'll tell you, it was the craziest thing I've ever done. When they first proposed it to me, really? they look, we think that it's going to take a lot. You're a pretty smart guy, so maybe you can get it together. And I said, well, what exactly are we doing? They said, well, there's basically a, close to 80 games that are televised somewhere in the country. And we're going to pull in these games, but you've got the games that kick off at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12, 12.30, 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2.30, 3 o'clock. I mean, that's something I think everybody forgets. And, and, and guys like yourself and me are sitting in the studio and we're literally jumping from game to game. And you're kind right. of setting it up with all the play-by-play -play of what, what we're seeing and everything and why we're going there. And then I've got to provide color, which means I got to know every quarterback and every coach and every team and every <laughs> – you don't Yeah, have and you can, you can fake it a couple times, right? Yeah. You can be like, oh, it's a great bootleg or whatever the play you just <laughs> saw. But – Really, our job is to provide context, yeah. what's happened from the year to date, you know, especially in college football, if they're undefeated yeah. or maybe, in, you know, in the MAC, if they're vying for the conference title or something like that, the stakes of the game, what had happened earlier in the game. So let's say yeah. it's tied, but maybe the team that's kicking the field goal with three seconds left was down three touchdowns earlier in the game. And maybe it's the first time we're dipping into this game. We need to kind of let sort of elevate the significance, the magnitude, Right. The, the excitement of that moment by just saying, you know, obviously a game winning field goal is going to be exciting, but just if, Hey, it's the largest comeback in school history, potentially if the may, you know, whatever it is, and we have a great team of producers and oh, people helping behind the scenes, but you're right. Like there was a lot of, uh, a lot of cramming for an exam, <laughs> a lot like Fridays, you know, things like that. But, but yeah. like yourself, you lived the season. I did too. So we kind of knew, yeah. um a lot of the, of the storylines yeah it was fun man I'd start Wednesday nights and I would just be buried trying to get through all these teams you know and you're trying to figure out who the starter is early in the season and who got right. hurt and all the it was it was amazing it was fun and, and I'll tell you it made doing color games uh I'd go down after that I'd go to like a Memphis game or you know I'm not I'm not the high level guy so I'm going to you know the next <laughs> level stuff but I'd go to a game down at SMU and I'd be sitting there going I only have to prepare for for right one team, two teams this is kind of easy yeah <laughs> so it was a great preparation thing for all that and it was it was that was really a lot of fun I was doing that until just a couple of years ago for ESPN and then I decided I better take a break before my wife wanted to divorce me for uh, never <laughs> being in the house so <laughs> yeah no it's it's a tough all of our analysts pull ridiculous hours and you know you guys train I mean it's fun I live in Connecticut but for the people who commute it's a lot to ask yeah, yeah. I finally sold my house in Connecticut just not too okay. terribly long ago. Um, and I'm living back in Minnesota. So I got to ask you, so talk to me a little bit about the whole gambling world and what you see. And obviously, shoot, the whole backdrop right now. But first, yeah. before we get into the backdrop, why don't we just talk about what do you what do you think about the world of sports and sports gambling in terms of what kind of size? We have DraftKings now. It's a tradable size. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting because I've been sort of – aware of it not immersed per se until the last 15 years or so but my whole life I've always been kind of aware of the point spread the game within the game if you will and the numbers part of it's always been intriguing and but however in America we've always had this sort of stigma towards sports betting whereas in Europe it's just part of the fabric and the culture right not that it's a dominating um, characteristic of sports but it is a component much like we've seen kind of fantasy here where there's not this negative stigma attached to it and it's it's called a concession experience, right? So 
it's not something tangible you would spend your money on. Like if you go shopping, retail therapy, if you will, and you spend money on jeans you don't really need, at least you come home with something in your hand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have experiences we pay for. Actually going to sporting events is one of those things, right? We, you know, for, nowadays, the ticket stubs are, are, are digital anyway, so we don't even have the ticket stub in our hand. But we have an experience going to movies, going to the theater, um, even things like whale watching or even wineries where you taste stuff. So you're, you're, you're spending money on entertainment, but it's not considered uh, losing money or wasting money. So in Europe, like gambling, sports betting is like spending money and not necessarily losing money. So when we go to we have commercials during football games, like guys getting wings and a bucket of beers, spending 50 bucks, three guys or whatever on a couple buckets that's like celebrated if you will it's part of like oh boys night out or afternoon out watching the football on the weekend and that's sort of how betting is sort of presented in europe at least that's the tone yeah. and I, we're not gonna we're not there now obviously but i think we're gonna get there i just don't i can't project a timeline per se but obviously the significance yesterday was the two-year anniversary or maybe two days ago it was the two-year anniversary of the uh, supreme court ruling and what that did is that lifted the federal ban. So there was a federal ban on sports betting across the United States that Nevada had been grandfathered in. So Nevada was the only state. So it lifted the ban. It didn't necessarily legalize it federally. It lifted a federal ban, so it allowed each state to proceed how they may choose, right? And then some states were very aggressive, like New Jersey were on the forefront. So right now we're at, I think the number 17 states could be 18. I apologize for not knowing it. But I, it's interesting you bring up the pandemic because while that's sort of put sports to the side for now, what it has also done, this is just my sort of opinion, is local municipalities need revenue more than ever. And so maybe the states that were kind of hesitant and reluctant and waiting kind of don't have an option now if this is an option. And now with the leagues on board, we, we have press conferences with like Adam Silver, the NBA commissioner, and even Roger Goodell on the dais with, with sports books. So now that the sports books are sort of validated, if you will, and that stigma is starting to erode, I think we're going to see more states join the party just because we've seen other states succeed and there's no like hoopla and it's not this negative hysteria. You know, Scott Van Pelt likes to say we're allowed to be adults. Like, let us, you know, we, we can buy scratch off tickets, we can go to bars, we can, you know, let us be adults is sort of the tone he wants to take. And that's what's happening. And I think other states, because of the pandemic, might accelerate that, that timeline. SVP is one of the all-time greats. Isn't oh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, he's only about, what, about five foot eight? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I walked past him up in Hartford one time at an airport, and I said hello to him, and he's just a wonderful guy. But, God, he's big, man. 6'6", <laughs> six, 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 I want to say, 6'6". Six, six. Yeah. Um, but that's just projecting. I don't know he's, that. He's sure. all of that 6'6", six, six for sure. So sure. um, Morgan Stanley just put out something just the other day, uh, Doug, and not that I expected you to see this uh, article, but um, their analyst actually talked about by 2025, if, and you were mentioning the number of states, but he, his projection was if all 50 states are involved, it's a $15 billion entity wow. by 2025. And, and I'm just curious, do, do you think... I mean, from what you're saying, it makes a lot of sense to me that there's a lot of states that might start saying, you know what, instead of it being 18 or 20 or whatever the number might be, it really could be 35 or 40 states before we can blink. And then maybe at some point, all 50, maybe not, but a much higher number than we are right now. I mean, it makes sense. So do you think that's something that, from what you're hearing, does it sound like something that really does make sense, at least to the governors and all the rest? Again, that's my speculation. I mean, it's all about... Right. I don't blame anyone for having their opinion. They're not supposed to know. Like, if I'm a politician in, I don't know, Iowa, why should I know everything about sports betting, right? Right. Like, they're, they're not supposed to be experts on everything, but you get the right people, you hear the right arguments, and you don't have to be first. New Jersey wanted to be first, right? And they were, and Governor Christie did a wonderful job pushing the bill, getting the Supreme Court, and did all that, and he deserves all the praise. But the other states aren't, like, you know, whatever it is in uh, Bob, Ricky Bobby, like first, if you're not first, you're last. So it's okay to take your time. Let, let other states work out the kinks, so to speak. And so now that they've kind of figured out the formula, and obviously Nevada's sitting there with the formula for decades, yeah. and it's saying, all right, we can do this. It won't be insufferable to people who don't, are, isn't for them, kind of like fantasy. I mean, it's kind of like uh, what fantasy is on sports broadcasts. 
you know, we're not running like a bookie in the bottom right corner of ESPN and say taking bets virtually. Like, it, we're going to figure it out and we're going to find the right balance, right? Much like we've done with analytics, much like we've done with sideline reporting or much like we've done with fantasy, right? There's, there's, there's a conversation to be had and maybe we'll have an, a second screen experience or shoulder programming or gamblers. We're, in due time, it's all going to kind of work itself out. But I applaud politicians who maybe were really reluctant, who are now like, all right, I've seen it work. Why be stubborn? Like, it could work for us. I have a, you know, I owe, I owe it to my constituents and the people who voted me in office and really all my, you know, people in my, uh, my region to do what's best for my um, area. And so I, I, I'm all for the fluidity of it all. Because, but one thing, Pete, that I, I always stress, and whether I'm speaking at a, a, a seminar or whatever, Sports betting was not invented two years ago, right? right. So, the, so the Supreme Court lifted the ban, but it's been going on a long time. So all this, I shouldn't say all, but nearly all of it was gone to illegal sort of entities, whether it be offshore. Or, so if you have all this stuff ongoing and it's already going on and you can actually tax it right. and make money off it and actually by doing that will make it more on the up and up and no, you know, bookmakers are on the same side of leagues they all want fair play yeah. so there's a way to all coexist everyone stays happy everyone eats everyone gets a slice of the pie so I, I think they're doing it in due time you know sometimes some people think it should go quicker and other but we're eventually going to get there it's just been fascinating to see that sort of ESPN get there a Disney company and it's yeah. been fun to be part of the ride yeah and, and Disney I think has a pretty substantial investment in DraftKings uh -huh. along with along with many others that are pretty right. substantially involved there so by the way, that Morgan Stanley analyst had an $8 billion number on it for 2025 and then moved it to 15 based upon how many states that he was projecting that really will start to participate. So those numbers are just amazing how fast they can grow to the upside. So I'll switch around a little bit. I love talking about this. So I'm curious, and I've watched you guys before, and I think you guys do a great job. So talk to me a little bit about... See, most people only understand, hey, you bet on a team to win or lose based on these points. Okay, that's it. That's their knowledge. They don't really know over-unders. They don't know some of the other things. But how about prop bets? Because the only time that ever comes up for most people is probably Super Bowl. Because the, right. the world congregates, the Super Bowl's here. Hey, how long is the national anthem? How long is it? What's this? You know, all that kind of craziness. But um, I've watched you guys with the prop bets and stuff. And what – what do you find to be the most interesting? Is it primarily, first of all, sport-wise, is are the prop bets more interesting? And in well, we have a se we have a segment called "All Tickets Cash the Same." So, <laughs> you know, it, a, a five hundred dollar ticket on the Super Bowl is going to cash the same as a five hundred dollar MIAC Saturday college basketball game, right? Yep. Like, yep. you just got to find the opportunities. Now, with that being said, and I talked about the entertainment component to it. There is a large port sort of utility that DraftKings and other sportsbook operators are providing in terms of entertainment. So, especially the Super Bowl, like you may not have an edge on over two and a half or three and a half field goals, but you just want to bet it, right? Like you just want to have some skin in the game. You want to participate in the conversation at the Super Bowl party. I'm all for that. Now, doing it for exorbitant amounts of money that, you know, you don't like, like when Jordan talked about in the last chance, he's like, I'm not struggling to put food on the table. I enjoy gambling. It's recreational for me. I make a lot of money. So don't, you know, don't look at it through the lens of X amount of thousands of dollars is like you're doing it. It is like, ten, you know, as I think Aldridge said, it's like 10,000 for him is like 10 bucks for us. And it's true. Yep. So uh, everyone wants, has their own sort of approach, but like anything, I mean, just to go on my little side thing here, like anything, anything in excess is bad, right? We have shopaholics, we have alcohol, you know, anything. We have an obesity issue in the country. So anything of excess is bad. Don't get me wrong. But so in terms of finding the edge, so our show sort of approach was to sort of do a sports center for betting. Yeah. Right. So we have, if you think of like the, uh, the menu of ESPN shows, there's a little bit of everything. There's sports center. And obviously that's the flagship show, but then there's like little sort of side things that are small, like PTI, yeah. college football live, there's live games and that's separate, but just like other shows, that don't look exactly like uh, Sports Center. They have a, some some common threads. So we wanted the first show. We wanted to be at sort of the cosmetic like look of of Sports Center. And so we are news and information with opinion, which is kind of like what Sports Center is, right? The six o'clock Sports Center has some big storylines of the day, injury news, suspensions, 
how's this going to play? And we have some analysts like Tim Legler will kind of project to the NBA game that night. How, how are they going to guard James Harden or whatever? So we wanted to approach it similarly and with, with our analysts talking about the games and with opinions, but we didn't want to just be kind of a tout show, just blah, 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 barking over each other because no one wants to listen to that. So we wanted sort of, so I'm the solo anchor. I get to kind of wear two hats. I get to drive the conversation, report the news, but then also interject and offer my opinion when I have a kind of a firm opinion. So we have a nice team. We have a nice balance with great production staff. I mean, that's the nice thing at ESPN. All of our guys have sports center training, NFL live training, baseball tonight training, and they're just excellent. So the, the, the handicapping is something we do in the morning or the night before. And we give sort of our, in, we give the, so our producers get the inputs and then they figure out the output. And how, it's really the presentation of it all. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the crazier ones that like, for instance, in times like this, and, and we're all in the, we're all living through a crazy time that no one ever expected. And there's virtually no sports, right? I mean, you right. brought up the last dance, but, and I lived through that. I was in Chicago during that whole thing. It oh, was wow. unbelievable. I partied a little bit with Rodman. And let me tell you, that guy really, <laughs> there's no you said a little bit. I wouldn't want it a lot. <laughs> oh my goodness. That guy was something special, but, uh, but, you know, when we don't have that type of thing around, Doug, how do you guys – What are you looking specifically now or, or, or there is there is – there, Well, the show's there dark right now. The okay. show is dark, and we're doing small digital segments. So we've been lucky that the NFL draft was sort of business as usual. That's yeah. something that bettors know about. And you can bet on props there. I mean, that's a lot of fun. You can bet, you know, two is going to go over under four and a half, which means one through four would be the under, or a fifth picker later would be the over. And so – We've discussed that, but then like the Brit Tom Brady news going to Tampa, we'll do segments on sort of the futures market or the, the Bucks over or under eight and a half, or excuse me, nine wins, things along those lines, or the Patriots over or under eight. Or should the Bills be favored? So there's, there's one thing a, a senior coordinating producer told me about two years ago with, with the betting stuff as ESPN started to really get going on it. He goes, sports betting is, creates a new conversation about sports. It's a new entry point. Even on Sports Center. It's Tom Brady's going to the Bucks, and you want to cover the who, what, where, when, and why. Of course, you want to bring in Schefter. You want to bring in Field Yates. What's going on? Hey, bring in Hasselback. Bring in Lewis Riddick. What does this mean for the, uh, the Patriots? Are they done with Jarrett Stidham as their quarterback if they don't sign anyone else? And then you do the other, right? You do the, all the other storylines. So you start with the big news. You do the other storylines. Well, part of the storyline is analytics. Tom Brady, uh, when facing this amount of pressure, is this – completion percentage the bucks have the worst offensive line you know there's that and then there's also the betting well the this this shift to the odds the bucks were 30 to 1 are now 15 to 1 yeah. so that's sort of interesting now i come in some of the other guys what does that mean right you know this like not all numbers mean the same you can't assume too much there is so much nuance in this industry that it takes someone who's been immersed in it or lives it every day just like it takes someone like yeah we know tom brady throws touchdown passes to gronk but you want yourself or someone else who played the game to explain why Gronk is such an asset against the cover two defense and the safety rotates. When he does that, it opens up my, you know, Vince, you know, or uh, Mike Evans down the, down the seams or whatever it is. So you just kind of want that explanation. And then we at ESPN do a decent job of kind of packaging information and presenting it. And that's what we've done on daily wager. And then, you know, I've got to, got to appear on outside the lines and sports center and do other stuff in smaller doses. But it's all about explaining that sort of other lane, what's going on here. So away from the betting now for a second, I got two last questions. And I know you got to go. I got to go. The world's all busy. But <laughs> <laughs> so one of my things is, first of all, uh, Lewis Riddick is a great friend of mine. He and I played together in Sacramento. Oh, nice. Before he got back in the league and then became, you know, part of everything that he's done ever since. Just an amazing guy. Love Lewis. Yeah. So please, we talk once in a while, but please say hello. You probably see him. I will. Talk to him more often than I do. Um, but so m number one, and then I got one to follow it is what do you think, forget the betting though. What do you think about the Tom Brady and, and just what could happen with the bucks? Are you extremely bullish on the idea? Do you think he's going to hit that wall where his age finally shows or where do you stand? What are the bucks? I played for the bucks. So I still yeah. love them. I'm kind of down the middle on this one. And I'll tell you why, because I know New England people might hate me, and I've said it, but I think it's more Belichick than Brady. Now, I don't think Belichick would have won six with any, without, any, without Brady, but I think he would have won a lot with him. I think he's a savant. With that being said, I don't know if there's a better – like, I think Brady was perfect, and I don't think – but I just think it was – Belichick deserves all the praise in the world 
because a couple of those Super Bowls were won with defense and stuff like yeah. that. Now, Brady is fantastic. His work ethic, what he's done, his, his ability to stay calm under pressure is like one of the single most underrated traits in all of sports. I don't think people realize how hard that is at that level with all those guys trying to rip your head off for him to do it and remain calm and do it all and, and be accurate. It's just, it's why he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback of all time. So I think he's going to bring a lot of that. I think his professionalism as well is going to infect the Bucks locker room. And I say infect, meaning a positive infection, yeah. because I think it's going to set the tone, much like when Tim Duncan set the tone for the Spurs, when you have your best player working the hardest, I think that's going to send a, to a locker room that kind of needed it, right? A franchise that kind of needs it. With all that being said, he's still going to be 43 when the season starts, but he has a lot of weapons. I think the receivers were really bad in New England. I think they're very good. I think the defense is actually not a bad, according to one analytics, DVOA, it was actually the fifth best. And when Jameis Winston throwing all those interceptions and it's short fields or pick sixes, you're playing from behind. Now, I think Winston is better at certain things at this age of Brady in some aspects, but I just think they're going to win a lot of games 24-17, 24-20. I think the yes-no bet out there to make the playoffs is very good. It's minus about a buck sixty right now, minus one six. So it's like one and a half to one for those unfamiliar with the turns, but because I think the, the, the Saints are just that good in, in the division. And remember, there's an extra wild card team this year. So you get three wild cards, and I just don't see another three teams beating them out, whether it be the Falcons within their division, whoever doesn't win the NFC East between the Cowboys and Eagles. I think the Vikings are going to win the Central, so it's either the Packers and Bears, I don't think both them. So it's like those three teams, and then maybe a team from the West, I think the Niners run away with the division. I don't think the Rams and Seahawks can be that great. So it's of those like four, five, six teams, I think the Bucs can be one of them. Uh, one of the three, three of those six, right? God, I love hearing that because I'm a big fan too. And I, I, I see a lot of the pieces coming together, even though he is 43 years old, like you said. And I like the defense as well. So uh, we're, it sounds like we're on the same page. Good. Uh, that last thing, and then I'll let you go. Lakers, you mentioned being a Lakers guy. You, being a Lakers guy, you have to know this is another one of our mini ties. You realize they're the Minneapolis Lakers, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, mean, the George Mikan days. Right. People just don't remember that. I always used to look at people and go, you know, there's not a lot of lakes out in L.A., right? You do yeah, but we have the Utah that. Jazz, so I think we got to fix that first, and then we'll get to the Lakers. Well, there's a whole slew of them. We know yeah. that. <laughs> okay, so here's my last thing, and I'll let you go. Uh, top three Lakers all time, doesn't matter where they were playing, doesn't matter anything, uh, probably mostly L.A., but what are your top three guys, then I'll let you go. It's, a, it's tough because Kareem doesn't get enough recognition. I agree. And and I think if when you talk about the greatest of all time basketball players, and I think it's a little bit of moving the field goal post, but I think if you include high school and college, Kareem's the best. Yep. Kareem, you know, those, those UCLA teams that had the winning streak, Kareem as a freshman was beating them in practice because he couldn't play and then did his own winning streak. And then uh, he was amazing in the, uh, the, the, what is it, the tower from Power, or Power High in New York. But he was, he was just that, when he was Lou Alcindor, he was amazing. Yep. And um, I don't think Kareem gets enough kind of like love along those lines. Now, Magic, what he did to save the, the sport, the Showtime Lakers, obviously very skilled too. And then what he's done for the city, just being such an important figurehead, it, it, those lines are all blurred. But if anybody who's worn a Laker jersey, you're starting to count, like I'd put Kareem one, Magic two. Now, I think Shaq was probably better at like one game than Kobe, but Kobe – for that longevity and that sustained excellence. And the Kobe conversation is weird because he only won one MVP, but his best sort of his prime prime was wasted on bad teams. It was like the Smush Parker, Red Monovich, Shannon Brown, Andrew Bynum teams. He was just at the tail end. Like when, when Shaq left in 04, Kobe was getting there. And then he won the MVP a couple years later, but that overlapped with LeBron and it was tough. So you can't just look at accolades because three of his titles were when he was the number two guy on the team next to Shaq. And then obviously he won two with Al Gasol and he was going to be traded. He wanted out and they were maybe going to ship him to Chicago. And then they made the Gasol trade Jerry West facilitated. So it's just really tough. But when you look at Kobe's longevity and all that, it's remarkable. So he's definitely there. So just my preference, I probably go um, Kareem, Magic, Kobe, but Kareem's best years were in Milwaukee. So it, yeah. it's, it's, it's sort of, and then obviously I love Jerry West too. So it's just really yeah. tough. Well, I got to tell you, Shaq, I've gotten to know over the years. He's one of the greatest guys I've ever met in my life. You probably know that, too. Yeah. I, to be in his presence is one of the oddest, scariest things that I've ever been around in my life because of his sheer just mass and He's size. massive. 
It's unbelievable. But a great and one of the best investors of any athlete I've ever really? seen in my life. That guy. Wonderful. He he knows what he's doing. He only will work on something that he has a piece of if he likes it. He has to use it or he won't do it. And I, I totally. It's refreshing. That. Yeah, yeah. He's a he's a really fun guy to get to know, and he, he's unbelievable. He's done such a great job investing. It's impressive, Doug. You're the man. Really appreciate it, my Armenian brother from another. It's always good to see. You. It's been a little while, and I hope to see you sometime soon, man. Likewise, I thought the last question was going to be like tzatziki sauce or hummus. Like it was going to be, you know, what do you prefer on your lamajuns? I mean, I thought you were going to talk shish kebab and pilaf. Like, what's up with that? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. My wife and I, since the pandemic started, we've had a Friday night dinner night, and we just we did it just to try to make people feel a little bit better about life because everything was so awful, and it's sure. gotten better and better and better, and people are getting through it now. We're still doing it. Tonight is our. I will give you a sneak preview. I don't tell anybody early. It's Armenian night. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I'm close to Boston in Watertown. Some some nice so so uh, my brother lives in Boston, has yeah. four kids, so I go see him. And when I drive back, I'll try to stop at one of the like authentic places. And then you can you know, I put the lambogens in the freezer. So I have a couple boxes of lambogens in the freezer. And then the pandemic, you're like munching. It's been nice. It's been a nice little snack here and there, maybe middle of the night too, because I've just been working from home. You know, we've been doing so much at home. But um it's it's food I miss from home. I miss some home cooking. That's what I miss. But yep. you know, I'm glad I don't have to cook it because I can't. But I, I, I enjoy eating it. That's for sure. <laughs> I do, too. Have a great one, Doug. Really appreciate your time. And, and thank you so much for doing this. It's good, good, good to connect, man. It's been too long. Be, be well. Enjoy the, enjoy the Armenian food tonight. Thanks, man. Take care. See ya.